So I think we can start our webinar. Um, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Hermann Hyytiela and I warmly welcome you to the very first webinar organized by Ivo Digital. Uh, today the topic is failure demand and it's really great to see so many people are interested in failure demand. Uh, we have the pleasure and honor of having Professor John Seddon as the speaker at this webinar. Uh, John is a leading management thinker and occupational psychologist who defined the failure demand as early as 30 years ago. Uh, the webinar consists of two parts. First, John gives an half an hour speech of failure demand, after which uh, webinar attendees can ask questions from John by typing a question in the chat window. The webinar hashtag is webinar. I will put this in the chat window in a moment. Uh, let me remind you that the webinar language is English and it will be recorded. Uh, the recording will be available later on. Okay, John, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Germany. And uh, uh, I, should, I should say thank you to you for organizing this. Uh, the audience might not know that we have been corresponding about this work for quite a number of years. Uh, so I'm very happy to be uh, <coughs> on your first webinar. So, Failure demand. Well, I, I was on holiday uh, last week uh, and I was having dinner with some friends. They said to me, well, what are you doing next week? And I said, well, I'm doing this seminar for people in Finland on failure demand. And they said, of course, well, what's failure demand? And I said, well, I define it as demand caused by a failure to do something or do something right for the customer. And so, of course, they would start discussing well what causes that <clears throat> and really interesting like most managers they would say well that must be the people not doing things that they should do or the processes not working as they should and they're wrong they're wrong it's natural it, it, it's how we would think it's the mental model that we would have about organizations but they're wrong so i'll come back to what the causes are in a moment but let me take you back to where it all started. Uh, it was in the mid 1980s. <laughs> I was working for a computer company uh, called Digital Equipment Corporation. They established uh, a, a business to sell computers over the phone. Now in the 1980s, that was a radical thing to do. And it's called Deck Direct. It was run by a man called Mike Swalwell. Uh, and I was there advising him uh, and he, his object was to make more sales, which is entirely reasonable because that's the purpose of that little system. Uh, and he had another advisor who said, well, the way to make more sales is incentivize the front line. You know, if they, for example, they sell, a, sell something that's worth more than, say, a hundred pounds, then give them five pounds, whatever. And I said, no, 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 no that's a very bad thing to do because what psychologists, I'm a psychologist, what psychologists know is if you create those kinds of relationships, people chase the money, which is not the same as serving customers. So, of course, Mike said to me, well, John, what would you do? And frankly, I said, oh, well, I don't know. Let's go, and, let's go and find out what's going on down there. And we spent a few days listening to calls. And we had all these calls that were, I called them at the time, I called calls we don't want. You know, like you sent me a blue one, I asked for a green one. This plug doesn't fit. I don't know how to work this. I, I haven't got the right amount of equipment to do what I want to do and so on. And I said, Mike, if we can solve those problems, if we can actually send out things that are clean and work for customers, then we won't get all this stuff calls we don't want and we'll increase our capacity and we'll sell more. And that's what we did. <clears throat> and then about the same time, I was working for one of the major banks in the UK and along came automated call distribution technology, which enables us to build call centers. Um, and what this bank did is they said, okay, well, let's, uh, let's send out the men in white coats and count up how many calls are happening in the branches and how long they take and that sizes the work and then we'll get rid of these expensive people in the branches uh, we'll build call centers in what i would call the armpits of britain where you can buy the cheapest labor 
uh, and we'll train them in our products and services and we'll move all those calls into call centers. You know, I mean, they talked about it being a service thing, but it was a cost thing, that's what the focus was. Well, they, be, they, they sized it, they built three call centers, I think they had a thousand people in each of them, and demand went up. So they opened the fourth and demand went up and they opened the fifth. Now at this stage, the chief executive is very exercised about cost because this is a cost reduction exercise. Now the costs are about the same. The men running, and they were men, running the call centers. So, oh, well, boss, this is, this is like the M25. Uh, the M25 is a motorway that runs around London. Uh, and when that was opened, it filled with traffic and it stopped. And they said, well, our call centers are clearly so popular, customers keep ringing us up. I've never thought of a bank as being in a popularity contest. Uh, and when we got out to study what was going on, over 50% of the demand coming into those call centers was failure demand. You see, they'd made the assumption you could just pluck a telephone conversation out of a branch and put it somewhere else. Um, what they didn't do is understand why the customers were calling, and, and I'll come back to that. When, when I met the man responsible for this right at the top of the tree, you bear in mind now he's got more people in call centers his costs are high uh, and he said to me well john you know if i can reduce call handling time by 30 seconds across the board it drops millions onto my bottom line and i'm sitting there thinking that you've got in excess of 50 percent failure demand if you get rid of that that's a more exciting number but why did he think like that you see, because frankly, they all think like that. This is, a, this is part of the command and control philosophy. Okay, so we've already talked about. So we, 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 it's all about cost. You know, so we we built call centres because we, we wanted to reduce transaction costs. You know, the next major event in the building of service organisations was the idea of a back office. <laughs> now, this is an idea uh, promoted by an American called Chase. Uh, most bad management ideas do come out of America. Uh, Chase said, you know, we've got this problem in, in our call centres that you've got a dilemma. Um, you've got people handling customers. Uh, sometimes you have to do work after the call to finish up dealing with the customer. They call that wrap time. Well, now you've got a dilemma because the phone's still ringing. What are you going to do? You're going to finish the wrap uh, or you're going to take the next call? He said, we well, can get rid of that problem. Uh, by minimizing the time you spend talking to customers in the call center, create a work object, send it off electronically to the back office. Now the customer can't interfere with you doing your work and you can sweat the labor. Um, so we've, you know, we all talk as though a back office is a normal thing these days. Well, it was only invented, uh, what, some 30 years ago. <clears throat> but that, why? Because that's about managing cost. Uh, specialization you know let's have people if you specialize work then you reduce the training costs and so that's all about cost too standardization you see in these organizations why well again because managers think that if you standardize things you'll be more efficient i mean this is a particular mistake of the lean community uh, why do they do it? Well, because in Womack and Jones' book, Lean Thinking, it says you start by standardizing the work. Well, that might be true in manufacturing. Uh, it's certainly not true in service organizations. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to why. <clears throat> but it's all about cost and activity management. And then you, you look into the kind of structure around the, all the, the, that work going on, and you've got all of these people <clears throat> wedded to what I call a core paradigm. The core paradigm is how much work is coming in, how many people have I got, and how long do people take to do stuff? So you have resource planners, whose job it is to make sure we've got the right number of people against the volume of demand coming in. Team leaders at the front end, trying to work on getting the workers to do things more quickly, working on activity, you know, how many calls you do, uh, and all that kind of stuff, managing people. Uh, and what are the managers doing? Well, the managers are discussing uh, all the work states. So, you know, you get lots of queues of work and volumes of work, and we've got to move people around to deal with the work. And we've got to focus on meeting our budgets. We've got to worry about our SLAs and, and all of that. So then let's return to the question. 
what causes failure demand? And here's the thing, all of that, all of that, shocking. You see, if, for example, in a call center, you're constraining people's time, you'll stop the system from absorbing variety. If you've got back offices, you've got two views of the customer, one in front of the customer <coughs> and one working to a set of rules. If you specialize work, you get more handovers, you get a lot of repeat activity as you go through a process. And that creates failure demand. If you standardize the work, you stop the system from absorbing variety because there is variety in the customer demand and that creates failure demand. So in other words, all of these things that we're doing are the problem. Now, there's a the thing. <clears throat> now, uh, my first love was intervention theory. Uh, and so if we talk about this from an intervention theory point of view, I have just told you uh, that all of the things that we do as managers are wrong. And now that kind of upsets a lot of managers. So it's not a good idea to tell them that what they're doing is wrong in a moment. But many of them told me as, as they've worked with me that I've kind of undermined everything they believe about management. And that's true. But the way in which to tackle this, the way in which to help these people see a better way to do things is to use what I call a normative strategy, not a rational strategy. So rational is I speak, you listen, you map it onto your mental model and you go, this man's mad or, or well, I think he means this. I want to change your mental model. The way to do that is through a normative strategy and that is to have you study things. Once you see them, you can't back away from them. So. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of this. This is, uh, 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 in this, this book, this is my latest book, Beyond Command and Control, you'll find it on the website. I give, I give a series of detailed case studies, and this is one. Now, this is a major insurance company in the UK. And when we met them, um, they had, uh, they'd outsourced a lot of their telephone work to India. Why did they do that? Well, to reduce transaction costs. They had 500 people in India dealing with calls, and they had 200 still in the UK. They decided to move all the work back from India because there were problems that the customers were having with dealing with people in India. And of course they had, as, as you would, uh, if you're a, a conventional thinker, they had a plan. Now, so the plan was, of course, that we would hire uh, another 500 people in the UK and we'd move all the calls. Uh, and we said, put the plan away. Let's go study. Now, <clears throat> We took them through the study and we took them through the redesign. And here's the thing. The result was they created a better service in the UK with only 300 people. So from 700 to 300, better service, lower cost, greater capacity, and the staff are happy because they're solving more problems for customers. Now, who would have put that number in a plan? We're gonna go from 700 to 300. Well, you and indeed, I would say you need no plan. You need no plan. You need to get out, get knowledge, make a change, and things will improve. You'll never know by how much. So, what are some of the things that you would get leaders in that kind of situation to study? Well, uh, here are some examples, uh, and this is one of the things that we should do in that case. So, let's take let's take a high frequency, predictable value demand. That's why we're here. Things that we're here to serve. So, let's take. Uh, I want to buy a, uh, an insurance product from you. Uh, basically, the way the system was designed, that, that will come into the front end. Uh, it will be handled in the front office. It will be broken into a series of work tasks that may, will go off to back offices. Could be three, four, as many as seven different back offices. Uh, and managers, uh, managers' notion was that if these people uh, did their things according to their activity times, uh, met their service levels, uh, worked to standard times then that all of this will kind of go through and come back out and work just fine so we will get them to follow one in detail uh, which you can do of course because we keep all these records and the only question that we're addressing is well, when it goes out to the customer are you absolutely sure this won't create another demand a failure demand so they do the first one they come back into the room and they would go, well, no, 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 it can't be worked. But, you know, that was different. So I'll take another one, take another one, take another. What they learn is that very little goes through this system clean. Now, you might have another group 
uh, that's studying at the front end, just studying the type and frequency of failure demand. And failure demand, of course, is defined from the customer's point of view. It takes them a little while to get their head around that. But once you get their head around that, then they understand it. They get a type and frequency. You can put these two groups together and they realize they're talking about the same thing, that the system doesn't work very well for a customer. And they're starting to understand that it's creating costs, it's consuming capacity because of all the failure demand they have to hand. Another exercise you might commonly do is to take the activity statistics in a call centre, for example, or in a back office. You know, how many things people can do uh, in a day or a period or whatever it is. Uh, plot it in a control chart and then go and study the causes of variation. You know, what is it that makes a call go shorter or longer? And when they study all the causes, uh, they learn that 95% or more of those causes are to do with the system not to do with the worker, which then raises in their mind the question, well, why are we managing the people? Well, correct, you should be managing the system. So these are the kinds of activities, and these are not look like, they're not training exercises, they go out and study, get data from your own system exercises, and that's what changes your worldview, it changes your mental model. And so then you help them move on to redesign it. Uh, and the principles of redesign, they were never uh, been accepted uh, originally from a command and control point of view, because basically what we're going to do is we're going to understand demand from a customer. And now we're talking about understanding value demands. That's why we're here. And that's going to teach us what expertise to put at the front of the system. OK, and we're not going to constrain people's activity. We're going to measure the actual time it takes because the purpose is to solve more problems for customers at the first point of transaction, wherever that is possible. OK, <clears throat> the three primary controls that you have in this kind of a system are knowledge of demand, a focus on only doing the value work and achievement of purpose in customer terms. And here's the thing. As you improve against those three controls, your costs fall and they fall dramatically. In these designs, there is no back office. It is gone. It is the antithesis to Chase's idea. Chase said, you want to minimize the time you're talking to customer. No, no. You want to spend the right time. You want to optimize the time you're talking to a customer or listening to a customer because this design relies on you really understanding what matters to each and every customer and serving that. So it's instead of uh, uh, standardizing the work, you're designing a system that will absorb the variety of customer demand. Now, if you put that to managers as a starting place, they'll say that's impossible, you can't do that. And I, I discuss all the reasons they say that in the book. But once they've been through the study and exercise, they see this might be a better way to work. So there's no standardization and there's no management roles, management people, all the management roles are designed to be working on the system. Uh, let's move on to repair organizations, you know, you might be repairing houses, repairing computers, that kind of thing. You know, a great way to start studying in those organizations uh, is to have the leaders go out with the people who are supposed to fix things. Okay, now you've got to bear in mind that these leaders are focused on productivity. They worry about the number of jobs per worker per day. That's what we need. Well, when they go out, and they're right at the front where in front of the customer with the person doing the repair. Uh, and again, the only question is when we turn up, can we fix it? And they get a shock because typically around 40% of the time they can fix it and all the other, other time they can't fix it. And so you're just going to question, well, what stops us fixing it? And do these things, are these attributable to the worker or to the system? And I think you know the answer. So it opens their mind to rethinking uh, the way they do uh, repair work. In, in the book, uh, I give a detailed case uh, of, repair, of a repair organization doing um, housing repairs where they went from a conventional design uh, to a design where they can actually give tenants a repair on the day and at the time the tenant wants it. That's amazing. Uh, and incredibly, in the first year of doing it, they saved eight million pounds on their budget. Why? Well, because the whole thing is working optimally. It's designed against demand. You call, we're able to tell you exactly when we can come 
because and I describe this is getting into a lot of detail when you get in the book uh, of because you, you because you know demand yeah, you can predict what capacity you need and you know how long work is going to take because you're using actual data. You're not working to people to things like books of standard times and all the rest of it. Uh, another great example in service organizations, care services, health and care services. I mean, here's, here's a question you can ask any leader uh, in a health and care system. Uh, you can ask them, the first question is, well, how many treatments, uh, procedures did you do last year? And they know the answer. And then you ask them, how many people did that involve? And they don't know. And here's the thing, when you go and study it, what you learn is that a small number of people are consuming an excessive amount of capacity in the system. So there's a signal that probably what we've got here is a lot of ineffective service. And the measure of that, of course, is the volume, the failure demand. Now you would imagine, wouldn't you, that if your life fell off the rails and you needed help and you put your hand up for help from the state, uh, that someone in a civilized society would turn up and help you. Uh, well, that doesn't happen. You get a whole series of people turning up typically, and we know this is, I don't know, I don't know what it's like in Finland, but we know this is true in so many other countries. Um, but you get a whole series of people turning up and they're all looking at you through their own specialist lens. You know, is what I've got right for you? Uh, and they've got behind them a budget number that is telling them what they can spend money on and what they can't spend money on. You know, so that their, their judgment of what they can do is governed by uh, their controls they set thresholds to protect their budget so you've really got to be bleeding to death to get any help uh, and they can meet their activity targets by closing your case and passing you on so you see a lot of that so you see all these people trooping through your house and when you address the question in studying it at what point did anybody sit down and understand what mattered to this person the answer is well not really ever you see because we're geared by the things that we've got are controlling us in our own system well, uh, again, you can take the same principles for redesign. If we understand the value work, we'll put the expertise that we need to serve that value work at the front end. Uh, and this is what people do. So there are many cases of this now in the UK and in other parts of the world, particularly in Australia, uh, in Denmark, in Sweden, where <clears throat> when you put your hand up for help, everybody gets someone to come and see them. And that conversation is to understand the person, what's happened to them, what the context of this is. And when that is clear to help them define what in their view is a good life or, or a good death. Uh, and then to help them take responsibility for doing the things they can do to uh, achieve that end. And then to deal with what help you might uh, be able to get from your family, from the community, from the voluntary sector and from state provision that is aimed specifically to help you achieve those ends. So you have to kind of get, get away from the idea that budgets control what you do. You have to get into the idea that the person's need, the thing that matters, governs how you spend the money. Now, the interesting thing is that when you do that, you spend far less money, you help far more people, far more effectively, and fewer people go to hospital, and so on. So all good. And it's really interesting, because those results are completely comparable to what's happened in Burtzorg. You may know about Burtzorg, it's the Dutch care system. But what's happened is, and this is so typical of management, you know, they hear about Burtzorg, oh, that's a great idea, let's copy it. Well, we've had a series of experiments with Burtzorg in the UK, and they think it's just about self-managed teams and looking after, let, let those teams make decisions about looking after people, but it's much more than that. And you see what happens in these experiments is they, they, the managers try to make them live within the current system. But the problem is the current system. So of course the experiments are pathetic compared to the outstanding results in Birdsall. Now I, I wrote a, a couple of uh, podcasts about this. You'll find them on my website. Because the important thing is that you've got to understand how Joster Block, the man who built Birdsall, changed his thinking. And he put it all in the public domain. You know, he was a he was a, a man who worked up through the care system, a senior manager. He saw new public management come, all of the targets and activity management and uh, outsourcing and costs and all that stuff that we do. Uh, and he could see it was wrong. 
And he argued that it was wrong. Uh, well, this is back to rational normative. You argue things are wrong, uh, you get ostracized. He left. He went away to the Ukraine to do some other things for a couple of years. When he came back to the Netherlands, the government had recognized they had a crisis in the care system. They put up money for people to have ideas and experiment. He put his forward. That's how Bertzel was born. And the results are fantastic. But you see, he went through a normative change himself. And other managers who copy it don't get it because they haven't understood. It's a thinking thing. Just briefly, uh, because it's so fashionable at the moment, I should mention uh, digital services. Uh, you know, it's the same business, isn't it? Why are we attracted to digital services? Well, primarily because it's a lower transaction cost. And so we see in so many cases that uh, we get these people coming in, doing their ag agile stuff and all the rest of it, and they, de they, they design a service as though it's a new thing, ignoring the fact that there is a service there already. They force people into <coughs> the digital channel, and lo and behold, you get a rise in failure demand at the other end. Why is that? Well, because digital systems work on rules. Rules are not good at absorbing variety. So, you know, I talk a lot in the book about all this digital stuff, uh, and my message to people is don't start with IT. IT is the last thing you do, not the first thing you do. Okay, the first thing you do, you study the system, get knowledge of the what and why of current performance as a system. Secondly, you redesign it to make it more effective. Then and only then can you determine what could be put into a digital channel. Because you're only looking for things that are uh, simple, repeatable, predictable. Computers are very good at those things. They're not good at absorbing variety. So there we are. That's kind of the overview. Uh, uh, the purpose is to eradicate failure demand. Failure demand is systemic. If you have a conventional command and control design, you'll have failure demand. There is no point. Don't blame the people. No, nothing to do with them. Don't blame the processes. Don't blame the departments. I mean, I was I was once shown uh, this guy came up to me and said, "Oh, John, you're going to like this. This is they call it the New York skyline. This is a histogram of all of the failure demand allocated to departments." Well, what are you going to learn from that? What are you going to do with that? You're going to shout at people. Does it tell you why? Nothing. No, don't bother with any of that. Don't buy software tools to count it and report it. What are you going to do then? You've understood nothing about the causes. All you can do is shout at people. Not a good idea. Don't think that doing things that get you a 5 or 10% reduction in failure demand are good things to do. No. The purpose is to eradicate it. Get rid of it. It's a systemic problem. Now, the truth is, you won't get rid of all of it. You know, that's something I learned from Demings. Well, things go wrong. Uh, they go wrong all the time. But you've got to understand what's going wrong predictably. And when you get rid of all the things that are going wrong predictably, your failure demand comes down to single figure numbers. Tiny, tiny. <clears throat> the only way to do it is to change the system. And the only way to do that is to have leaders start by studying the what and my performance from a different point of view and changing their mental models. Okay, there is no alternative. If leaders say, yeah, this is great, go and do it out there. I don't need to change my mental model. Uh, it's not a good idea because they won't know how much they're going to interfere with it as it goes down the road. So there we are. If you can eradicate failure demands, you'll have fantastically better service, uh, fantastically better morale, better capacity and lower costs was not to like. So <laughs> I'm going to now see uh, whether we've got things in the chat box. Let me have a look here. OK, let's you have to wait by this. <clears throat> oh, someone says, what if failure demand is completely hidden? Uh, mm. Well, I, I can't. I've never worked in a system where it's hidden. You know, because you're studying demand at the point of transaction. That's you know, I, I can't I can't conceptualize it as being hidden. It's usually very obvious. 
Uh, Timo says, completely agree that budgets are an obsolete way of steering the business, that's right. Uh, you mentioned that resources should be allocated to actual need. Uh, what is your opinion in the mechanism how total company resource allocation be steered? Uh, well, it's, uh, that's more straightforward than, than you imagine. Um, because you know what you're building is is a system where uh, you're you're developing the expertise required from the front in the front line. You know whether you're talking about repairing things or IT help desks or or service uh, service to customers and so on. Um, and I mean you're using your the thing is you know the old resource management was about. Um, just about controlling the worker against the demand do you separate resource planning uh, in the systems that we help people build from the work you know so you're using the actual time it takes uh, and then you take that off to the resource planners because if we know more and more about the actual time it takes we'll be more accurate in resourcing the front end to have the wherewithal now of course managers would think if they haven't been through this if you're taking the actual time then the time will go longer. No, no. If you focus on doing the right things, the, the focusing on the value work, so on, uh, time is less in every transaction as you get smarter in doing it. And so your resource planning is, is well, well, just a straightforward thing to do. Let's see. I've got some more here. Uh, Oh, well, Nick was very kind saying, good to hear me. It refreshes the brain. Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, is there and what is the weak point in failure demand thinking? Uh, well, I, I covered that. It's blaming the people, blaming the process. It's not understanding that it's systemic. Why do I shy away from publishing case stories of my work, studies of my work? I think your work is great. Good way of convincing people. Uh, I probably know, Michael, I, I publish loads, loads. I mean, if you... If you've got this book, it's full of cases. Uh, if you're on my website, it's full of cases. Uh, there's also a whole body of work uh, on the website that shows people all the basic steps in studying transactional services. Most services are transactional. Uh, I make all of that available. And there are lots of case studies and applications in there too. So now I, I, publish, uh, I publish quite a lot uh, of case work. Um, uh, so next one is what has been the most difficult issue with the management? Oh, well, managers, who, you know, all my life, I'm at the end of my career. The number of times I've said to leaders, you know, uh, we can't do this without you uh, being able to change your thinking and we're going to help you change your thinking by the things that we do. And uh, boy, the number of times they say to me, oh, we're completely open-minded, John. No, they're not. No. As soon as you, it, it, this is the rational versus normative thing. You know, if you challenge something that they know how to do every day and they think it's wise and all the rest of it, uh, you have a problem. Um, because, you know, they're, they're not open minded. They've got a view of the world and we've got to change their view of the world. Uh, so Timu says, can you mention an example of a 100% resource and cost-driven organisation, how the mental model has been able to sold to this organisation? Well, well, if you don't sell it, you know, this, this, work, this work can't be pushed, it has to be pulled. Um, but boy, I mean, uh, I don't, I, uh, I, I guess what you're saying is how do you sell this to people who are obsessed with cost? Uh, well, the, well, the answer is you don't, um, you don't. Uh, but as you get out there and studying, they realize, you know, I often say that managing costs causes costs. Uh, so when you're in a world where they're starting to see them for themselves, that managing costs causes costs, then, they, then you can open their minds to a better way of managing. And of course, you know, what this is about, when you understand demand, you put the expertise, that's about managing value. When you manage value, costs fall out. When you manage costs, costs go up. Uh, and can I say again the name of the example person who changed the mental model? I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure what that means. Uh, but everybody that you work with uh, in, in my world, if you apply the Vanguard method, uh, you're helping the leaders change the way they think about the design and management of the organization. Um, oh, Bob Marshall. Hello, Bob. Nice to see you here. Phil Crosby said that determination to change must precede management's education about the change process, then implementation could only follow education. Um, well, maybe, I don't know, Bob. <laughs> I often find that uh, determination to change is built uh, through the early stages. You know, as they start learning things that they wouldn't have believed otherwise, it creates energy uh, to do something different because you can't get away from what is in fact a uh, pretty difficult truth. Um, Timu's question links back to mine, says Michael, if you had a library of case studies you could point a client to someone like them that might convince them. Well, there's an interesting thing, Michael, you know, um, uh, people are not actually convinced by case studies. Um, I my experience that, you know, you'd think so, wouldn't you? You know, if I, you know, if I go back, for example, to housing repairs, um, the very first job we did in housing repairs uh, was in Portsmouth. They saved a fortune. They're the first housing repairs organisation to deliver, to deliver repairs to the tenant on the day of term, day and time a tenant wants it, and they ripped their costs out. Now, interestingly, they were visited by a minister a man called Grant Shapps, who was a minister of housing at the time, uh, and he saw all this. Was he convinced? Well, you know, his next announcement had nothing to do with what he'd seen in Portsmouth. His next announcement was something that would play out in the Daily Mail, for, uh, that's a, a newspaper, and that is that he's going to have tenants do their own DIY, fix their own problems. And of course, that never happened. Uh, because social landlords have a legal responsibility uh, for the property. Uh, so no, not even ministers can be convinced. Uh, I mean, I, I spent uh, more than 10 years talking to people in our government uh, about results. Uh, but, you know, what politicians uh, do, they look for things that fit their view of the world, their narrative. They're never close enough to study and understand kind of what's going wrong. Uh, I gave up. And so anybody who wants to know just how bad uh, our public sector is and why I should read the book I wrote in 2014, The Whitehall Effect. It's what governments have done um, <clears throat> actually around the world. Uh, I mean, our current government has just adopted deliverology, which Tony Blair's government played with, and it failed in here, it failed all around the world, and yet it suits their political ideas because it's something they can talk about in the newspapers. Um, from P W to everyone, in addition to your books, are there scientific research in the method and its benefits? Yes, lots. Uh, here's the thing. <laughs> I, I, uh, oh, I must have been about 20 years ago. I was, I was, uh, I was teaching in a university. I've, I've collected a lot of visiting professorships, because you know, basically it means that I'll teach for free. And I teach for free because I can't deal with the administration in universities, they're so dopey. Anyway. Uh, uh, this, this professor said to me, well, you, what you do is really interesting, John, but it's not real. Uh, I said, what do you mean it's not real? Well, it's not in the literature. So uh, I, uh, I have a researcher, and he and I and some others uh, have researched and published lots. Uh, and and I've, I've had a, a Palestinian uh, professor. I gave him access to, I, I give academics access. To, so we've had lots of academic publications. Uh, I even appear as, as a complete chapter of the Vanguard Method in Mike Jackson's book uh, on systems, um, and it don't make a jot of difference. That's all, in my world, that's all rational. It doesn't change what's going on. But there we are. I did try. So here we had somebody else. I know. Uh, Okay, it's a long one to read. Well, I mean, I've, what I've got here uh, from ESCO is he worked at the UK lo local authority on the planning system, uh, the time to do planning uh, uh, was reduced, costs went down, things were better six months after, 
it grew. Well, I don't know why. So why why does this have immediate results then don't stick? I don't know. I mean, this is, you know, I, I've seen an awful lot of examples. I remember we worked with, um, uh, we worked with a company that sells uh, office equipment. Uh, if they're a retail environment, uh, we help the leaders of that company change everything and improve everything. Uh, and then that company was sold to an American organization who came over and basically said, well, you know, all, all good, that you, they're very interested in the stuff you've done, but you need to put in these controls uh, so we all know what's going on. And these controls were known by the directors to be the wrong controls. Uh, uh, and they had an argument and then the directors left. Uh, I could take you into insurance companies where our work was going like a train uh, and the chief executive moved on to another place. New chief executive comes in, doesn't understand it. Basically, they don't. You know, I, when I have chief executives who say to me, well, can you do this without me being involved? The answer is no, because if you don't change the way you think about the design and management work, you're going to have a train crash down the line. So there are train crashes that occur because people who don't understand what, it, what is happening uh, come in. However, I think the most important thing is that everybody who goes through this and changes the way they think stays across the Rubicon because you can't go back when you know. Um, uh, Michael Corbett's laughing, not in the literature. Well, it is now, it's all over the academic literature. Do you can, Bob Marshall says, do you concur with Voltaire? Is there anyone so wise as to learn by the experience of others? Mm, I'm not sure I'd agree uh, with Voltaire. I think it's very dangerous to, learn by the experience of others because we you know this problem is we, we map it onto our mental model it's difficult to change uh, the way you think i'm also conscious that you know deming taught me not to confuse experience with knowledge you know there's that wonderful joke about a, a japanese manufacturing expert turning up at a factory uh, having a look around and then saying to the boss how long have you been here and the boss said oh 20 years uh, and the Japanese manufacturing expert said, oh, I thought you were going to say 20 days, because in his mind, there's so much needs to be done out there. And uh, PW to everyone says, well, thank you for P this PW, whoever PW is. This is so refreshing. Thank you. And thank you, Herm Hermione, for this session. Well, thank you, PW, for coming. So I, th I think, oh, do we have any more? Do okay, Tommy says. I said, don't buy the software tool to count the failure demand. But isn't the first thing to do in study interface to get understanding the situation, what customers want and how, why and how? Yeah, uh, good. Uh, and uh, uh, customers, I see that failure demands many times caused by the system and outside of the customer. I don't know. I don't know. I think the important point that I'm making is that, you know, uh, uh, unless you've got something I haven't seen before, uh, machines aren't like people. Um, you know, failure demand requires an understanding of, uh, of the, what's said uh, and the context. OK, um, I think AI is a long way from being there. These, from what I've seen, um, uh, but you know, I I think what you're doing, uh, uh, Iwo, do you pronounce it, uh, is very interesting. Um, uh, but I I'm just I, I I suppose my 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 concern is that I've seen lots of products in the UK uh, that are designed to go out there, have people tick boxes, send that data up to top management, so top management can shout about it well that isn't going to get you anywhere really so well um unless there are any other questions uh oh uh, uh Emily is saying how do you improve health and care services uh well uh well we've done a lot of work in health and care uh, as has uh Jostablok, uh in butzorg you know, the, the, the single biggest problem we've got in the UK health and care system 
uh, is the fragmentation. Uh, so we basically designed a system that has no continuity. You know, in the UK, if you have an acute event, something really bad goes wrong, uh, you get through to experts immediately and you get sorted out. That's good. After that, it's a pain in the ass because there's nobody looking after you. You've got to look after yourself, and manage your own way uh, through the system. Now, that's a big mistake. Um, uh, so you have to design a system. You have to design a system against demand. You know, we, we did some studying in a, in a hospital on the South Coast. Um, and for all uh, of the primary health conditions, you know, things like strokes, hips, whatever, the, the demand uh, was predictable. Well, that's amazing. So now you're halfway to actually designing a service that will work well because you know what's going to come. Now, you see, nobody, you know, <clears throat> this is true of all command and control systems, they treat demand as volume. Whereas I'm, what I'm saying is we need to understand the type and frequency of demand. There are two types of demand that are important. The value demands, well, get all those types and you find in most systems that are predictable. Uh, and failure demand, uh, we can't do anything about that until you change the system. Um, uh, could you tell how to get, I, I try to talk about how to get leaders interested in demand and failure demand. Well, uh, this is Yari. Uh, you know, what I've, what I've learned um, is you've got to do things that make them curious, that make them pull, you know, so you could, you could send them papers, you could send them a book, you could send them a video and see whether or not they kind of go, oh, this might be interesting. Now, I was, um, you know, push is wrong. You see, I, I'll give you an example of this. I was in front of the man in Scotland responsible for health and care systems in Scotland. And I said to him, well, with social care systems, failure demand is running at over 80%. And he just looked at me and said, no, it isn't. I studied it. He hasn't. <laughs> Mina says fragmentation, I guess we're talking about health services, is a true problem in Finland as well. Uh, and Mina is saying that benefits related to income, all oh, things moved, uh, decided by two parties and customers' data is not. All, okay, well, okay, good. <clears throat> Great. So you, you see, you know, there's an opportunity here. Uh, now, of course, to do anything about that, you've got to get the leaders of that system to study what's going on. It's no good just you knowing that. Uh, Chris, Christina says, how on earth do we do the paradigm shift from the service system to the customer? Uh, well, the simple answer is really get a handle on demand. You know, what my, mes my message to you is that understanding value demand is the big lever. It's a big lever. It will ramp up your productivity if you can design to serve it. Uh, Alex Sharp says, can you recommend a management thinker book paper? Are there recent thinkers that have influenced you? Um, well, the big influence on my work originally in the 1980s was uh, Deming, the American. Uh, he was, his book, Out of the Crisis, is an important read because it tells you what's wrong with uh, Western management thought. He gives examples of managing manufacturing as a system. I set out to understand service organizations as a system. I have read all of the systems thinkers. Uh, and I would say to you, Alex, you know, be cautious. There's a lot of systems thinkers out there. And I, uh, I think an awful lot of them are interesting rather than useful. OK, um, but I've read them all. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, Russ Akoff, uh, but I've read them all. Um, uh, and what I'm always looking for when I read other people, I've read Skengi, for example, when it all came out. And if you see my copy of The Fifth Discipline, it's got handwritten notes all over it. But my preoccupation all the time with him and with all the others I've read is, what do you do on Monday? Um, and I know what to do on Monday in service organisations. Uh, Mary is saying, how would you aid the shift towards prevention and health promotion in healthcare with regards to that? Yes, yes, I, okay. So this is the idea that, you know, we should work on preventing uh, things going wrong in healthcare services uh, rather than uh, respond to demand. I agree, I agree. But I have to tell you this, I think that's like the advanced course. The first thing we've got to do is improve the services that we're currently offering 
because we're wasting a lot of public money kind of doing things that aren't helping people you know the classic case is commissioning you know but if you if you go to the market for a service you need to have a price if you have a price you've got to specify it therefore you've got to standardize it and you find that standardized services don't meet the variety of people's needs you're wasting all that money you know so i think our first priority is to design services that work and then secondly when we can understand how predictable demand is we should be working on prevention because if we're successful in prevention we will get a reduction in demand of those types uh, um, uh, Bob is saying uh, he needs a shameless plug for organizational psychotherapy memeology I'm not sure what memeology is but where I agree completely with Bob I have high regard for Bob is that the way we think is the key to outstanding performance improvement um, and Herman is saying, could I briefly describe the theory behind my work, Vanguard Method? Yes. Uh, basically, the Vanguard Method is, is, is a combination of two bodies of knowledge. Uh, one is, well, how do you study and then design service organizations as systems? Uh, and the other is intervention theory and practice, which in the 1970s was something I studied in a master's program and became the thing that was my first love. Now, when, when I've been teaching people all my life how to, how to apply the Vanguard method, they all think the stuff you've got to learn is the how do, you, how do you study and how do you design. Certainly, you've got to know that. But the stuff that's more important is the intervention theory work. Because the question becomes, how do you help others through the whole process of studying and design? That's quite a tall order. And, and it's a lot more than knowing how to do it yourself so the vanguard method is a combination of those two things so we have uh, a few more minutes if we have any other are uh, the theories of systemic organizations involved in, in, um, i'm not sure what that means pw the theories of systemic organizations involved in my in my work uh, yeah <clears throat> there are a lot of people who say that I'm not a proper systems thinker. This is an extraordinary thing. You know, I published a book in 2008, Systems Thinking in the Public Sector. It put systems thinking on the map. It opened the door for many people who talk about systems, uh, but a lot of them beat me up because I don't do what they do, uh, which is apparently proper systems thinking. Uh, but hey, I do what I do, which is a, it's a systems uh, approach, a la derived from the work of Deming, uh, this is going on in 11 countries. Uh, people have fantastic results, and yet they tell me I'm not a proper systems thinker. Well, you know, as we say in England, fuck them, doesn't matter. <clears throat> uh, Timo says, how are bad quality and failure demand related to each other, or are they the same thing or different? If you go and get a haircut and the result is not good, <laughs> I think you go and get a haircut and the result is not good, don't go there again. Um, well, it's, it depends kind of it's about how definition, operational definitions, isn't it? You know, it depends how you define quality. Um, yeah, if you if you take the view uh, what quality is all about uh, in service organisations is uh, understanding what matters to customers, treating that as the nominal value in Taguchi terms and delivering only to the nominal value then you're doing you know the same as, as i've described here so it, it's just a, it's just a question of operational definitions so there we are well uh, i think i think i'll wrap up uh, i would say to you uh, if any of you have any other questions thoughts whatever uh, send me an email i'm easy to find if you can't find me ask a seven-year-old they'll find me and i promise any of you that send me any messages uh, I will uh, reply. Uh, Melia says, any ideas for social office process improvement specifically? Social, um, uh, I don't know. I don't know what social office is. Uh, how does it, oh, leadership and sales. How does this all apply to leadership and sales? Isn't it that bad leadership is actually failure management? Well, maybe, maybe. But, you know, uh, somewhere near to you in, in Denmark, uh, we worked on sales for uh, an insurance organization, you know, a traditional 
you know, sales managers, people going out, making appointments, selling things the company wanted to sell. Uh, we help them study that to discover all of the sub-optimization that, that creates. Uh, they redesigned it by under, understanding customer demand. They got the underwriting expertise closer to the demand. The sales went up by 25% straight off the bat because it's all about uh, the customer's nominal value and sales as pull rather than sales as push. <clears throat> okay, social work. Well, I was, uh, I was, this is uh, me again, uh, ideas for social office process improvement specifically. Uh, yeah, social work. Yeah, we've done tons of work in social work. A uh, whole chapter in this book uh, on care services, um, plenty on my website as well on care services, and I talked about it earlier today. So lots, lots of experience with that. However, She says thank you, or he says thank you. I'm not sure whether it's a he or a she. But there we are. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, uh, I'm going to buzz off. Uh, uh, if, you, As I said before, if you have any other thoughts, questions, send me an email. I promise I will reply. But otherwise, for now, thank you, Hermione, for inviting me here. Thank you all for coming. Um, and hopefully we'll meet again sometime in the future. Goodbye.